Greg received the Bachelor of Science from the School of Business at Villanova University and a Master's of Architecture from Columbia University, so a great combination between business and architecture. I actually often thought that every architect should have psychology, business, and architecture. But you did at least two of the three. <laughs> Step ahead. He has lectured and published globally and has held shared professorships and at schools such as Yale University, Columbia University, and the University of Virginia, among others. He serves on the board of directors of the Architecture League in New York and is a Young Leaders Fellow at the National Committee of the United States-China Relationships. It has been said that the start of SHOP was maybe found in Columbia 1992 housing studio when uh, actually more people in this group were in that environment. Um, but especially Bill Sharples and Greg were both in that class, were forced to work together. And I read this funny story, this actually I think comes from you, that they were reading Deleuze and Guattari who are philosophers from France. And we're getting more or less in a very hairy situation in that studio. But then also decided that if they could work together in hairy situations, that maybe that was also a good start for an office, which is something to think about, right? And so their collaboration started very organically. Eventually, um, SHOP was co-founded by partners Greg Pascarelli, Christopher, Chris, Chris Sharples, uh, Coran Sharples, Kimberly Holden, and Bill Sharples in 1996. I actually know the twins, um, Chris and Bill, from my very first office on Mercer Street, where I had one desk for $150 a month. Um, and in the back was uh, an architect that had worked for Stephen Hall Architects, and Bill and Chris were working with them. We had no heating. It was very cold, and especially in the front. So once in a while, we'd run to the back and hang out with the twins to kind of get a bit warmer. So that's how you start as, a, as architects. And in the middle of that, they were actually already talking and starting to do competitions together. So interesting is that you know these collaborations they start very often not as a major business plan. They start as organically working together, starting competitions together, and really figuring out that you know in difficulties you find each other and you also learn how to work together. And of course their big boom, like actually many other people, was for the PS1 installation where they blew everyone more or less away. Uh, it was absolutely an amazing hard work, I remember. Hard work, but an amazing installation. And it really became the start of, I think, shop as we know it. So. From there, from that little pavilion in PS1, they are now um, doing many things. I'll mention a few, Atlantic Yards, uh, Atlantic Yards, and the shop intentionally challenged long-held conventions within the architecture community about the domain of expertise of architects and about the process of build, how buildings are made. So the, the whole idea, and I think this is what we've been seeing from that little pavilion to all the big projects they've done, it's really great to see that there are architects that are really looking at how things are built, not only in the US, but now internationally. And you know, we all as architects are fighting the construction industry. We try and collaborate also with them, but it's not an easy thing. And especially, I think, when you try and innovate and you have the unions across the table from you, this is a long battle. Their project now include many more, of course. We have the Barclay Center at, Atlantic, uh, at the Atlantic Yards. We have a two-mile park in the East River waterfront in New York. I still have to ask you about the purple on the bridge. The Innovation Hub Government Complex in Botswana. The South Street Seaport Redevelopment in New York City. Uh, a major league soccer stadium in New York. Projects for Google in the Mountain View in California. I just discovered that in between there were three embassies and a consulate that they're now building in Italy. And currently they're uh, also working on quite an amazing uh, project that is a 1,426 feet high uh, Steinway. So Steinway is the piano uh, label Steinway Tower in uh, 
Manhattan that is the skinniest tower. It's 60 feet wide. So this is kind of a normal lot where you normally build a townhouse, really. Uh, they, man they managed to build the skinniest tower. I think for now the skinniest tower in the world. Uh, but not just skinny and not just high. It's also, again, one of the things they've been looking at is how to innovate uh, buildings through uh, prefabrication of varying systems, and in this case, really beautiful terracotta blocks with a very small lace-like uh, pattern going through it. And I have to say that that kind of um, beauty that made me think, I was, I was actually at the opening of that tower and I was looking at it and I was thinking it's interesting, in history, skyscrapers have been developed on the ground floor and on the top, think Chrysler Tower, Empire State, uh, towers like that, and what is interesting, uh, and I think what you started to do is like really that digital craft can bring us to the point where architecture itself starts to be part of what maybe could be called ornament or that there is no differentiation between architecture and ornament, but it is one thing. And so no longer a top and a bottom, but actually the whole tower itself now becomes part of that system. They are also known for large-scale development projects like the Domino Sugar Factory development, Essex Crossings, and the Shukul Yards. At the heart of the firm's method is a willingness to question accepted patterns of practice where necessary beyond the architect's traditional roles. Greg will highlight certain projects that illustrate shop's approach to intense detailing, prototyping, and real-world R&D, research and development. Discuss the marriage of traditional material systems with innovative techniques and emphasize the importance of architects preserving a productive focus on the public realm. Their first monograph, Out of Practice, was published in 2012 by the Monocelli Press. And it's actually a great book because it feels very much like a, a work book, if you can say, of how a practice works with that many partners, equally male and female, uh, still more or less all together, which is also quite a, quite a thing. I've seen many, we all know, many architecture offices combine, split up, and recombine. Um, and yeah, we will hear more about that. So that, that is one of the books. Did you publish anything? That's the one book. No, we're way, way on our second book. Good. Second book is coming. Um, also, I should definitely mention, of course, that this lecture was generally sponsored by KPF, uh, and KPF's co-founder, uh, Eugene Cohn, has been recently awarded with the 2019 Cantatrice Medal of Excellence in Architecture and Environmental Design by Penn. He will be recognized at the Weizmann School of Design Awards Gala in New York City in Gary's building on the West Side Highway on October 21, and we're very grateful for KPF and Jean Cohn's continued support. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Greg Pascret. Thank you, Winka, very much. Um, it's wonderful to be back here in Penn and to see a lot of dear friends, uh, survivors of Columbia. And, uh, uh, but it's great to be here. It's been almost 10 years since I last spoke at Penn, so it's, I'm very happy to be back. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that was a perfect intro, even though we didn't discuss it in a sense, because I do want to talk about how you get from sort of being a student and then having a small practice and testing out some ideas and then how you might be able to pull those into very to larger scale projects, more complex projects, and, um, and what it means in the way that we practice and some of the things that we see uh, in, the profession, in the profession that are shifting and changing. But it does come back to those friends and those people and the people that you care about when you're, when you're in school, when you're starting to learn all these things. And, we could turn these lights down if, if you would like, if that's possible. Um, but you know, I think that when we were in school, it was kind of a, there was kind of a split. There were like the sort of people who were thinking and writing and critiquing and doing kind of crazy designs, and then there were the people that were sort of executing large scale projects. And we, and you sort of had a choice at that time of like one or the other. And I think from the very beginning, we were very interested to see if we could sort of be a, a both and firm. And that was a big driver for the way that we've always thought about architecture to be equally a thinker and a maker. 
Um, we, uh, I don't think that we have a predetermined style that's, very, that's not very important to us, but we always just ask a lot of questions. It's how we approach every project when we start, just to think about what are the different kinds of impacts and influences and ways in which we can solve a problem. I mean, that's what I think we do as architects is that we're, we're, we're great generalists and we can think about a lot of different ways and how do we bring it together to solve a problem spatially. But just as Winko is saying that there's this kind of issue with, with the construction industry, what, what we found very early on was that here we are, all of us are people that are really good at thinking three-dimensionally and four-dimensionally and five-dimensionally, and, and then we reduce our information to a two-dimensional convention of lines, and then we expect people who might not be as good at that three-dimensional thinking to extract that information from 2D and build it in 3D, and it's frustrating for everybody. And that's really kind of the source of a lot of the issues. So very early on, what we realized was one of the big limits of architecture was, was this sort of plan, section, and elevation convention of drawing, and that we wanted immediately to look into other industries to think about how to transmit far more complex ideas to help the building process and to get the ideas that we wanted built and get them out in the world and see how they worked. And so Winka mentioned PS1, um, which we won in 2000. Um, and it was to do a pavilion um, that was about sort of uh, the sand and surf. It was called Dunescape. That's the full set of construction documents, um, which were 30-foot uh, uh, by 15-foot full-scale templates. That's pretty blurry. Um, can you focus that? Thanks, Charles. Yeah, that's better. OK, that's better. And it was all about following a color code. Nope, now that went out. OK. Okay. And, and then it was about a kind of straight translation from these full-scale templates into um, a sort of surface that embodied, the surfaces of the, of the pavilion embodied structure, surface, and program, and blended it into a single thickness and created this, this uh, pavilion, which we only had three weeks to design and three weeks to build, because it was the first year and they didn't really know how to do it very well, and so it was, it was pretty tricky. Um, but that led us into sort of thinking more into uh, the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, and what were the kinds of drawings that would get built in order to make buildings that had, let's say, a lot of architecture but didn't cost more money in order to do them. These are actual uh, CD drawings from our pavilion. Um, we did a camera obscura in a park on the eastern end of Long Island. This is in 1999. So there were two kinds of drawings, you know, drawings that would tell you how to make the parts and drawings that told you how to put, put it together. And then, you know, every single part for the little pavilion, it was 2,200 parts, no two were the same. And then it went together basically like the most kick-ass piece of Ikea furniture you've ever seen. Um, and that really, that we really learned how to do things putting these together. And then we, we wanted to sort of understand more things about the political and the, and the financial end of things. And so, we did a project where we bought an old warehouse and then we, we put the deal together and we did an air rights transfer and we figured out how to finance it and we brought in a partner and we built this addition on the top and then it was very interesting because, you know, because we were a partner in the deal and had figured the whole thing out, no one was there to really tell us no and so we said, but except for ourselves, so we said, well, let's use this as an R&D project to see if we could fully fabricate a facade system um, um, out of, you know, without any drawings and digitally, digitally executed, which we did. And we, it was 4,000 different panels of zinc. The, the laser cutters put the, the code system on the front of the building so that basically the architectural detailing of the building itself became the architectural, sorry, the instruction set for putting it together became the architectural detailing of the building. And we brought it to market and sold it. And um, you know, it really, it really, it was the first rain screen built in New York. It was the first fully digitally fabricated facade in the country, and it was really a kind of interesting process to go through. Only about six years later, we were approached by um, by Forest City Ratner because they were having some issues with their Atlantic Yards project in the Barclays Center, and and this was the biggest building we had built at the time, which was 50,000 square feet. And suddenly they asked us if we could redesign an NBA arena 
and did we have the ability to do it and that they were really worried about us. It was a billion dollar project. And then we took them to see this and we showed them the drawings and they said, are you out of your minds? You guys just like invented a system and built it yourself and fabricated all the parts. They were like, you're so crazy, we're gonna give you the project because, because they were like, you know, we, they couldn't believe that we just, we just did it. And interestingly enough, it was the same exact techniques that we used, but just on a much larger scale, where it became uh, 11,500 different panels of steel, core 10 steel, that sort of used a kind of uh, custom strut system that got you off of the environmental enclosure into 921 panels that were exactly the largest size panel you could bring into New York City on a truck without a special permit, and then they were all fabricated off-site. Um, we actually took over the making of the panels, we created all the fabrication tickets, we cut them, we hung them on a dry cleaner rack that they went around through 14 wet dry cycles a day for four months to put 10 years of the rust patina on it. We wrote our own iPhone app to track the cutting of the panels, the weathering of the panels, the assembly into the mega panels, the delivery, and the instruction set for putting them on the building. Here you can see as they're going through the the system, and we were able to deliver to deliver the building, and so that got us sort of from like 50,000 feet to the billion dollar mark in just about five years, um, and, and it fit together perfectly, and um, it didn't have regular drawings. We took on all kinds of risk that the AIA tells you never to take on. Um, we totally threw away the contracts that they tell you to sign, and we rewrote new kinds of contracts, and it was taking that risk that gave us the shot at projects like this. And while I love the building and it's really great, I think one of my favorite things is um, because I do, I do love sports because to me it's sort of like theater with an unscripted ending. And so we really wanted the, the, the court, you know, like sports venues like kind of look like shopping malls and airports too much and I don't really understand why. So we really wanted this thing to feel like black box theater and the whole time for three years I kept arguing with the client if you're going to move the nets from Brooklyn to from from New Jersey to Brooklyn, you got to change the colors from red, white, and blue, and they should be black and white, so it matches this sort of black box theater kind of feel to it. And they kept going like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever, for three years. And some of you might remember that um, Jay Z was a part owner of the nets at the time, and then we were in a a design meeting, and there was a two million dollar change order to paint the steel and on the roof black. And I was trying to convince the client that it was totally worth it. And um, I was like, we got to paint it black because it's going to match the uniforms. And then Jay turned to me and he's like, oh, you want to change the uniforms to black and white? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you know, that's a pretty good idea. And they were like, absolutely, we're changing the uniforms to black and white. <laughs> so you know where the architect stands on all that. But, um, but we got them black and white, and they went from 26th in the league in sales to 6th in the league in sales in one year. It's probably worth 40 to $50 million which of course we got a cut of. Um, anyway, I think um, the key thing though was it was, a, it, was a, it, was an, it was the first arena built in the United States that had zero parking. And that was super important to us. And the whole design was based around the fact that people who come by public transportation have the best experience. It, it has to ride over people that come by private transportation. And as a result, 85% of the people take public transportation to the games, and so it was about extending that space. We continue to do lots of research with um, 3D printing and robotics and uh, using uh, sustainable materials. This is um, 3D printing of bamboo that we used for our pavilion that we did at Art Basel a couple of years ago. Um, or at the Milan Furniture Fair, we did some techniques of extruding and 3D, 3D fabrication of terracotta to create a pavilion um, at the Milan Furniture Fair. And so it's this constant sort of on the thinking side of thing and risk taking things, but equally thinking about the making that I think continues to propel the ideas of the firm forward. Um, we're, still, um, we're still doing a lot of stuff like that. So this, we're, we developed a tool to help us do the drawings, but it's as much for us to do the drawings as it is for the construction industry to, um, 
to know how the buildings go together. So you can wear these goggles and you can see the full 3D model of any part of the building at any time. And the guys in the field can do this. So instead of them looking at plans and sections and elevations and not knowing what to do, they can literally take it apart. They can also do it in time lapse and play with it. And they can see what piece has to go where and when. And that's what we found out when we were building Barclays we had the whole thing digitally modeled, and the, the, the steel workers, we were doing that Oculus, which is a, an, an 85 foot by 200 foot cantilever. They had no interest in looking at drawings. They wanted our architects up in the bucket with them, showing them the digital model and spinning it around. And they were literally looking at the model on an iPad and putting the building together. So we've been playing with a lot of stuff like this. Um, that happens to be back on the camera obscura because we've written it for projects that are all under NDA, so I can't really show it right now. Um, but anyway, you know, art and science and mathematics come together, and in a lot of ways, we always sort of think about that as the sort of marriage between those three as design. But a lot of the ways that we think about about things are that it's more that design has to filter through politics, through finance, through social responsibility, through theory, through technology, through many different things. And that that to us is when it gets to architecture. And that's always been the way that we've thought about it. And that, and that having a fluency and an understanding and, an, and an, a kind of reciprocal relationship with all of those things that sometimes they tell you don't pay attention to, just pay attention to the building, we don't really believe that. We really believe it's important to get your hands dirty and to think about all of those things and to understand how they work in order to push projects forward for the creation of great space and great cities. So sometimes we ask questions like, how do you create meaning through context? And I'll show a few projects now. One is Nine to Calb, which is um, going to be the tallest building in Brooklyn. Um, so it's a project at the corner basically of DeKalb, which is right off of Fulton, and Flatbush Avenue Extension in downtown Brooklyn. On the site right now is this spectacular, both exterior and interior landmark dime savings bank. And our client owned Lot 100 and the Dime Savings Bank, and we could have pushed and built a big slab tower uh, along Flatbush Avenue Extension, but we didn't really think that that was a great idea and that we really wanted, the, the interior of this building is magnificent, and it was in really bad shape, and so we wanted to restore it, and we wanted to make it part of a public program again and really integrate it into the building itself. So the triangular site, the original architects, used hexagons and six-sided stars to deal with the geometry of the site. And so we said, why don't we take sort of a clue from that? And so we thought about the triangular site and sort of took that geometry and brought it across the whole building. And then we said, what if we made the tower a series of interlocking hexagons and, and ask Landmark's permission if we can build on top of the Landmark, which has only been granted three times to put a large tower on top of the Landmark, and, um, uh, and that we thought it would make a much better building. The other thing is because this is the only building that's zoned for something this tall, um, and so it therefore will be this kind of you know, lone object out there uh, after it's finished, we wanted a building that didn't feel like it was all glass. And so we wanted, we wanted to use the hexagons in order to put two of the facades in the oblique in order to then give a kind of heavy texture to the facade so that two of the three facades that you were looking at would look solid, and you'll see that in a second, so that the building had a kind of uh, centering to it. In New York, all the, in Manhattan, the grid is primary avenue, secondary street, but in Brooklyn, all the grids are different as they meet up, so that there would never be a kind of one particular way or a majority way that you would look at the building. And so that was the other thing about the hexagons, which we did the, we did the setbacks in a kind of spiral that every side had to feel like the primary facade, if you will. And so we looked at this notion of fluting for the facades, and we looked at nature, we looked in historic buildings, we looked in contemporary art of how we could do it. And we went with a color palette that went sort of from white to black white ceramic and bronze and black stainless steel. And we abstracted series of, of sort of shapes and extrusions out of the historic building and began to make literally thousands of compositions of these different pieces to make this kind of thickened facade. And we just did it by trial and error with all these parts. And we brought light across the facade and we photographed it. 
and it ended up becoming the facade of the building itself and with different thicknesses and different color combinations as it went up. And that ended up becoming, here were some of the, these were like eight foot by eight foot large scale models that we were testing the different pieces. But you see how when you look at one facade on the oblique, it turns completely solid. And that was really important to us. And so there you see the tower as it sits on top of the landmark. And then there's a another part of it that's a base that has to be put, um, uh, that has to fill out the rest of the block. Um, this is looking up from the landmark building. And so we looked at the sort of fluted columns that we had, and we thought it was kind of interesting that some, some were innies and some were outies. And so we took the idea of a kind of convex fluting and a concave fluting, and we said, what if we could bring those two things together and make a single five-story pilaster that would be milled out of solid marble into what we call the convexicave column? And the convexa cave columns then now run along the whole facade of the rest of the base of the building. Um, here you can see the details as they go from the top to the bottom. They're clipped in by, um, by bronze uh, panels. And then where they turn the corner, it sort of makes these large scale entries. And then this is how the rest of the block is finished as you come up and approach it. And then we use the roof of the landmark as part of the amenities for the, for the the building and maybe my favorite feature about it is that we put the pool around the historic dome so when you're in the pool the dome comes up out of the water while you're lying there you know sipping a cocktail or something um, but it's it's super fun and you can see the building this is taken from the Barclays Center looking back down Flatbush Avenue and then this is a um, this is a new tool that we've been developing in-house so that you could see the buildings done before they're built and walk around the whole neighborhood um, and just look at it as it, gets, as it gets finished. And then let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, and then these are, this is, we're filming the inside of the VR goggles. So this is that other tool. So you can, you can this is just walking around live at the site and you can see the building and all the parts and this is what the contractors can can use while they're putting pieces together and understanding the building and now we're actually using it with with um, government groups and uh, you know for getting entitlements and with landmark groups and with um, finance people for other projects around the world so you can bring a group out who are interested to see how it impacts a neighborhood or community groups and you can put it on and you can see what the building what the building looks like in 3d live as you walk around the site so let's see so that's what the building will be when it's done we've just finished the foundations on it it was 64 caissons that had to go past two subway lines um, took us an extra six months uh, but it's, it's on its way, and um, we're really excited to, to, to see it come to fruition. Um, other times we think about design in other countries, it's one thing to do a building in, in New York. It's another thing to do a building on the other side of the world. It's one thing to do a building in a, you know, a first world nation where technology is available. Can you also do this in sub-Sahara Africa where there isn't that kind of uh, level of expertise? So we've spent a lot of time, this was a competition that we won. Um, the basic concept was to sort of take the two geographical features of Botswana, the dune and the delta, and bring them together into a kind of uh, a series of banded buildings um, that then uh, we berm the whole site up. You have to cover your parking in Botswana. And they build these giant tent structures all over the place to, to cover them. So we said, why don't you just build the parking on the ground and we'll lift the building up and then we'll berm the landscape around. And it, it, it ended up working. And then for, for uh, it came out of sort of environmental reasons, we did these sort of series of oases and then proposed the sort of largest um, um, green roof uh, in Africa on the top. And then there were these kind of fabulous trees that we wanted to keep. And so we said we could just leave them down in the parking level and let them grow up through the oases. And so <clears throat> this ended up being um, the model of the building. It's a government complex. Um, we looked at uh, patterns, a lot of patterning from uh, structures, traditional structures and basket weaving and studied them and looked at them for walls and all the public spaces using local trees that we planted when we first got the commission and let them grow for seven years and now we're harvesting those trees to make the walls uh, for the building itself. 
And so then this was the sort of, you could see the cars sort of slipping in underneath, and this was the original idea for the building. Um, they've been fabulous at building it, a little slower than we expected, so we're on year 10, but it's almost done. <laughs> um, but uh, they did, they, we did build the building, they did phenomenal work with, uh, with concrete coming off of our 3D cut files. We spent a lot of time working in the university with a lot of knowledge transfer um, and did a lot of work with um, how to build the facade. And then this is kind of, this is kind of cool, so I'll just talk what we talk about. So we, we keep a catalog of how we're doing the digital technologies for every one of our buildings so that we have a kind of uh, repository of data and information. So here you can see Botswana and how we break down each part. A lot of this is sort of inspired by the way Boeing makes planes. And then every single part is modeled fully. And so we were kind of doing BIM before Revit was a thing we were, because we were just dumb, we did it ourselves. And, um, and so we kind of wrote our own software to do a lot of this stuff. But basically by having these instruction sets at such a level where everyone could very easily understand everything that you were doing, we were able to get a kind of very complex a building built, built in a place like Botswana. But you can see the sort of level at which we model, how they come apart, how it's easy for them to understand, and then how all these parts then just get sent around the world for the pieces to be made. The pieces get made, they get sent to a place, we assemble them, and then the, it goes on to the building. Sorry. And so here you can see the guy starting to put the panels together and you can see the facade of the building going on. Um, and it's, um, this is anodized aluminum. It's um, uh, four, different, four different shades of the gold. They got very upset when the, part, when the parts came and they tried to sand them down so that they would all match. And we were like, no, 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 we, we want the difference. Um, but you can see the building as it's getting done. Here you can see one of the oases. And it's literally, you land in Botswana and you come out of the main airport going towards Gaborone, the capital, and there are two buildings, the Diamond Exchange and this building. And one, the, the president says, that's our past and this is our future. And it's, it's about transferring their diamond wealth into seeding technology industries for the future of Botswana. So we were very proud to work on a project like this. Um, you can see the green roof and how it fits into the landscape and walking on the paths and sort of as the sun set. So the, the big cantilever part at the end that you saw at the beginning is the last part for them to build. They, they, they did it once and it sagged a little and so we had to take it down and do it again, but that's okay. Um, you know, so what is this technology for? What is it doing for us? Why, why is it important on some projects? So 626 First Avenue, we call the American Copper Building, are two, two rental apartment buildings, quite frankly, on the east side of Manhattan. But they have a very large affordable housing component to them. And it was a very difficult master plan. So it had gotten rezoned in the mid 2000s and the problem was that they put, the, the master plan put the park on the north side and a school on the south side and to build out the FAR, you had to push the, the tower right up against the back of the school. And so it was tricky and it was a very prescriptive tight envelope. So our client, bought the site and he said, I've got this envelope for a 48 and 43 story building. I'm not going through a, a, a rezoning. What can you do within this? So we said, okay, well, what if we just took the floor plate and made one building be as far to the south and then go up as far to the north and back as far to the south as the zoning envelope allowed and do it the other way from the west to the east to the west on the other one to almost inscribe the limits that the buildings had. And then we were required to build this park at the bottom and we said, instead of having just like a typical amenities package for each building, why don't we build a bridge between the two and make one phenomenal one for, for the whole complex? And then why don't we use that bridge like an extension cord, put all the mechanical on one building, plug it in through the bridge and therefore free up the roof for another, another uh, uh, sort of shared public space. And so then we thought about the sort of facades and the bridge we wanted to be something different. Um, and then it really wasn't that hard to do the building. It was, from a structural perspective, really the only trick was in the mechanicals. 
because you can't install all the plumbing lines on the four degree angle that the building slope because the toilets then will stick up in the air. So you had to sort of model and do everything here and it was all fully modeled in BIM and that was really the trick for getting it done. Um, and so it's, it's 770 units um, uh, with about 200 of them being affordable and we didn't want to make it like a cheap building. It should be, we felt our clients said make it as, make it as beautiful as any condo or high end or fully market rate building that you can. Um, and then we showed them, we wanted to do um, uh, a solid material on the south and north and then do the east and west in all glass, which was from a performative standpoint was much better for the energy performance. And so we showed them everything from like painted metal and then, you know, galvanized and then zinc and, you know, and then we went up to brass and then we went to bronze and then we went to copper. And we said, well, what if we make it in copper? And he was, and our client said, are you out of your mind? We're not making out of copper. What are you gonna do, show me gold next? And I had, I flipped the slide and I had it in gold. <laughs> and he said, F you, I'll take the copper. <laughs> and that was how we got it, honestly. I was like, yeah, we can do it in gold. That'll, that'll be um, but I think the, um, the best part was that um, we, we convinced them to leave it as raw copper so it came like a shiny penny and it will eventually turn to Statue of Liberty green. Um, we've heard anywhere from 15 to 50 years for it to, to take place. Um, so we we're kind of excited about it. So the buildings uh, got built and here you can see the sort of from the west, you can see the bridge connecting between the two. And then that was sort of the trickiest part because you had the two buildings bending in two different directions. So it's really the bridge is a rectangle, but it's in two directions, a parallelogram, which was pretty tricky to build. We did a different sort of uh, a mesh glass so that it reflected light and really felt like something different. And then the bridge really had three levels. One level was all the mechanical. Uh, the upper level was sort of the main living room for the space. And then um, you can see how it connects right here and clips right into the two buildings. And then maybe my favorite thing in the building is that we put the swimming pool on the bridge so that you could swim from one skyscraper to the other, um, which, is really, which is really fun. So you can see the East River out to the side and you have the, um, here's the main living room above and you see the city skyline in the other direction. And the lobby, the patterning of the copper Again, all digitally fabricated, uh, looking up at the folds of the building. This is from the ferry terminal when you arrive, coming towards it, and, and the building at night. And so it's, it's now completed and, and about 95% leased and really has kind of created a, a great community in a very far east part of Manhattan that sort of was a no man's land. Um, but we're, we're, we're very proud of it. And, and the great thing is that the, the level of finishes are fabulous for everyone who pays market rent or pays a highly subsidized rent and that the people who live there are thrilled and excited and spend a lot of time in all the public spaces and it's really created a kind of wonderful community. And something that only could have been done with that technology to get a building of that level of quality for that kind of stratified income. It's a lot easier at Steinway Hall, but we'll talk about that next. Um, Midtown Center is an office complex we just finished in Washington. Um, and so we looked sort of at the history of the L'Enfant plan and city planning. And basically this building here was the building we were gonna replace. This was the, the Washington Post headquarters for many years, um, which is this kind of not very good brutalist concrete building and sort of created almost, even though it's between like three metro stops and areas, no one went here because there was like, it was like anti-gravitational matter, like no one wanted to walk around this giant site. So we said like, look, what if we think of the Washington office block in a totally different way? What if we think about like the college quad and what if we do the opposite of what everyone's doing, which is security at the perimeter and why don't we lift the building up and let the public just go right through the entire site? And instead of, the problem with doing most buildings in DC is you have a height limit and the building, si the building plots are too big. Um, might have worked in, in, in France 250 years ago, but you end up with all these atrium buildings and those atria are really kind of depressing with that sort of brown crappy light and no one wants their office on the atria. 
So we convinced the client also to open it as a U building facing south and to put this public park in to allow um, light to come in. Uh, we worked with Scape on this park and Kate did a fabulous sort of uh, grounds, groundscape and then there are seven different triangular retail pavilions that then fill in the space around the two cores for the park, which you could see here. Um, and then the facade, we wanted to, we took this idea of the kind of, we were using copper again on this project, um, but we were taking it sort of from the copper uh, details in a lot of the Washington buildings and we did this notion of a kind of changing sawtooth that took the sort of quad plans and even put it up into the facade and into the section of the building itself. So the facade, this time the, the client didn't want to wait 50 years, so they paid to pre-patina the copper, so it came, it came green. And then you could see the building and how it lifts up with sort of all the glass and cut through areas going down. And then the trickiest part was figuring out this whole way to sort of short circuit uh, between the two sides of the U, because if you were on the same floor and you were on one corner and had to get all the way around, it was like walking three blocks to visit your coworker. And so we proposed this notion of a series of, of bridges. So it was a three-story atrium connected to an indoor bridge to a three-story atrium to another bridge to a three-story atrium across to a two-story atrium. So it made this continuity through the whole project. And you could go both inside the bridge, uh, weather protected, or you could also walk on the roof of the bridge if you wanted to walk outside. And so when we did that, um, uh, one client loved it so much. It was a spec office building, a million square feet, which is huge. And one client took 800,000 feet based on that drawing. Um, and it was Fannie Mae, who some of you may know. And the CEO of Fannie Mae said, make me the most beautiful building that you can without me having to testify in front of Congress why we, why we rented it. So um, uh, we, we did our very best. But it completely changed the culture of Fannie Mae, which was in this kind of old, uh, sort of um, Georgian estate thing out in the suburbs with security lines, and now the public comes right in and it's really kind of repositioned um, the, entire, the entire organization. Here you can see the, the retail has, is just going in now, so these are, these are actually still construction photos. And then the sort of lobby systems and the kind of view from above. Um, and it's being incredibly well received in Washington and, and super fun and really kind of beautiful. But again, not a big budget, a spec office building, but something that really connected to its context and was only executed sort of through, through technology. Um, the bridges, the fins on the bridges are kind of great because they are all glass and they're not super wide, but when you walk on them, the, it creates a sort of moray pattern that makes you feel safer because it looks solid even though it's mostly glass as you, as you cross the bridge. Um, it's definitely a little bit more fun taking the outdoor one on top. And then funny enough, we were designing these at the same time and we put bridges into both projects and, we were, and my partners and I had an argument because we were like, who came up with the bridges first and we can't have bridges on both things and blah, 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 blah. And I said, I was like, don't worry, neither of these are gonna get built so we don't have to worry about it. So we did the two bridges and then both are getting built. Um, so uh, anyway, Uber came to us. They, they, they had bought a site, unlike all the other tech companies that are in the suburbs, they really wanted to be downtown. So they asked us to think about this network of parks in Mission Bay, which is where the new stadium is gonna go. We looked at San Francisco and the sort of verticality of the parks and, and the way in which people move both horizontally and vertically. And so it was this idea of kind of rotating the city, uh, rotating the building up. And we were working on almost 8 million square feet of tech offices for the last decade in the Bay Area. I can't really talk about most of them. This is the only one that's really public. Um, but it's been really interesting R&D about the changing workplace and this notion of sort of the open office floor plan, but not one that's all on one level and moving it through different spaces. And so that was a real driver. Um, and the client wanted, um, wanted all the collaboration spaces to be connected by stairs as much as possible to get people walking between all the places when they're not programming. And so we ran scripts and sort of did all these kind of studies of connective tissue and how you could connect all these places. And then all the collaboration rooms end up becoming the facade of the building itself. And it's all connected by in this kind of almost outdoor front porch 
on the two facades of the, it's two buildings connected by the bridges. And this also had a very strong environmental uh, program because the, the environmental laws are really, are really strict in San Francisco and so it was this notion of a sort of way of capturing light, of making the building as transparent as we could, uh, but still uh, really, really performing well um, environmentally. Um, a lot of studies about, about plants and cleaning the air and how the HVAC systems work. And so basically what you see is the sort of, can you see the cursor? No, you can't, okay. I'm going over here. So basically from here, that's where the environmental break is. So back here are all the programmers and the computers. Those have to stay in air conditioning and everything in the front is actually outside. Um, it's covered, but it's outdoors. And that becomes all of the, the connection between all the, the collaboration rooms. And so we call this sort of the front porch of the building. And here are some sort of feelings of what it's gonna, what it's gonna be like. And then this glass wall on the side is basically a series of 15 foot high by six foot wide bifold doors, facade system. So basically the building measures the air, the flows, the temperature, the wind, everything, and opens and closes automatically to keep that front porch at the right temperature. So here were the mock-ups of the facade. And then, and then the other thing that we wanted was that when you were walking on the street, you could actually see right up through that facade. So it made a kind of connection between the public and, and the, the corporate headquarters. And so here's that view under construction. And then there you could see the different facade elements opening and closing. And the building under construction right now. They're all closed there. This was just taken, I think, last week. Um, and then here you can see the bridges going across. You'll notice that there are three in the renderings, but only two in reality. Um, San Francisco just wouldn't, they had to take something. So we lost a bridge. <laughs> um, but anyway, you could see the, you could see the bridges connecting um, and they go over a park. So we sort of did a reflective material and this is where you come into the main space. And you could start to see that we actually have already put the plants in. So while the building is under construction, they're already starting to clean the air. They're already starting to grow to mature. We're testing the irrigation systems and they're, they're kind of already, they're already working on their way. And that's the rendering of, of what it will look like when it's done. So we're pretty excited. Um, just two more and uh, we'll be done. Are we okay time-wise? Okay. So this is the crazy one that Winko was talking about. Um, so we had a client who approached us and said he had this really tight little site in Midtown and a lot of FAR to build. And when we started to look at it, we were like, this is kind of, this is kind of amazing. Um, and so he bought Steinway Hall, uh, which is where Steinway Pianos were, were, were uh, it was really their showroom and an office building above for about 100 years. And so we had to start to think about the argument uh, because you could build next to it, but it would have made a kind of uh, not a great building and we needed to build on top of the landmark. So the, the only time that's happened was, was Foster's Hearst Tower. And this was the second time that landmarks approved it. And the third one was Nine DeKalb, the one in Brooklyn that we did before. And so, you know, we looked back at like the whole history of the sort of low and high of the soaring tower and the, the, the lower fabric. We looked at, at some of the classic skyscrapers that New Yorkers love, and it's not just that they're old or that they're stone or whatever, but I think part of it is really the proportion of the buildings that are, that are kind of great. And of course, these are all pre-World War II when you don't have air conditioning, and so you can't have the giant floor plate, so it made, and they're all offices, this is, it made a certain typology, which made a certain kind of skyline. And of course, after World War II, you know, air conditioning, uh, corporate efficiency, the 30,000 foot floor plate, it makes very different kind of buildings. And we love these buildings as well. It's not negative. And obviously, some of them are absolutely spectacular. But it just makes a very different kind of skyline. And now we're at this moment where there's just a few sites left that can sort of absorb whatever, whatever FAR is left. And you're getting this one other layer of a few of these super tall towers. And so while 60 by 80, which is really the dimension of our building, seems incredibly small, it's actually, the, the Chrysler building is only, is only 90 by 90. So it's, it's, of course it's still smaller, but it's, it's not quite as different as we think of it like relative to a building like MetLife, which I'm sorry, I still call the Pan Am building. And um, so we had Steinway Hall. This is a Warren and Wetmore building, the same architects that did Grand Central. 
And we could have built the building sort of right in front, which would have really blocked the light of the kind of beautiful tower. But we made an argument, let us slide the building around the back, let us build on top of the landmark, we'll do a complete restoration of it and really kind of celebrate the building. And um, landmarks agreed. And so there's a sort of retail podium. There's, um, there's then a, a 200 foot uh, uh, amenity level which gets the first tower apartment over the landmark to get the view of Central Park. And then we sort of wanted to test and challenge the idea of the setback. And so there's the sort of traditional way of dealing with the setback. There's the kind of folded plane following the sky exposure plane that's going on today. And we said, is there another way to do it? Could we make a much smaller kind of finer grain dimensional setback and have each pilaster sort of create an arc where the building then just dissipates into a point in the sky? Um, to get a building this tall and this thin, it's basically a giant H of concrete is the best way to describe it. So there are two monstrous shear walls out on the facade and we put them on the east and west because those were not the best views. And there are some small punched openings, but really it's a giant solid wall of concrete. It's five feet thick and uses 50 rebars, which are this big. And 50 rebars are not meant for buildings, they're meant for dams. But that's what we, that's what we had to use. Um, and then because we were building the building through both an exterior and interior landmark, we had to set them by hand and dig down by hand under the building, get to the bedrock, set these two-ton uh, rebar cages, and then start pouring the high-strength concrete all the way up. So instead of having this kind of dead you know, party wall, sheer wall facade, we said, why don't we make something that's really celebratory? And could we take each pilaster at each setback and, and using digital fabrication make many different molds that twist the, the terracotta, they ended up being terracotta, twist it back and forth so that when the light hits it from the south, you create these uh, patterns of shadow and light. And so there were 26 different shapes, six different colors. That was the rendering of the building. That's looking from 5th and 57th, looking west. And then these were the renderings of the facade. Um, and then it's filled with a cast bronze filigree between the two. Here were the VMUs, visual mock-ups and then the facade starting to go on the building. And so to the north and south, it's just the sort of bronze um, um, extrusions. And then I know this is, I just shot this with my iPhone the other day, so I'm sorry for the quality, but you could really start to see the patterning of the shadow as the terracotta goes up into the sky. Um, and then we opened up the sort of north and south for, it's one apartment per floor. So you come off your elevator. Um, the elevators are double stacked. There's only two elevator shafts. So one's a passenger and one's a service. And they ride in the same, in the same uh, shaft together. Um, and then uh, we're about 200 feet taller than the Empire State Building. Um, and then towards the park, it's really mostly a glass facade to open it up, again, with these bronze inlays. And everyone gets a 60-foot living room uh, dead center on Central Park with 15-foot floor-to-floors. Clearly not part of our mayor's affordable housing initiatives. Um, and then even if that's not good enough, you can get a duplex where you get a double height space. There are seven of those in the building. Um, and then we even designed, we worked with Bill Sofield and like a lot, of, like my favorite thing is a lot of the architectural, a lot of the detailing of the interiors are actually inspired by the building itself. And I don't know why I don't have a picture, but my favorite thing is all the door handles are a model of the building and the setbacks uh, cast in bronze in the West Village. And so here you can see the interiors and the crown going up, which is, so the, the concrete ends, there's an 800 ton mass damper to keep the, the, the movement. The, the texture of the terracotta actually helps slow the building's acceleration down. Had it been just taut glass, it's like an airplane wing, and so it actually picks up speed. So it was super performative. But then once we, we had to cap the mass damper with a five foot thick slab to hold the thing together at the top, and then the, the, the spire is made out of steel, and um, this was taken Monday. So you could see we poured up all the way the mass dampers in that last setback, and now we're just doing the spire of the building um, all the way up. I think we have 60 pieces of steel left. There it is from Central Park, the facade going on. 
And there you can see um, uh, the, the sort of light and shadow pattern on the side and the view from the, the, view from the top. Um, last project I'll show, it's, it's been super fun. It's really cool to go up there. It's scary as shit, but it's really, it's really kind of great. Um, um, and we're, we're really excited and it's got, we don't know how much it's gonna, no one really knows how much, the truth is no one really knows, but you, you, you guess as best you can, you hope it's not too bad, like, um, we'll see. But the facade's not all the way up, so you don't have the full force yet. Um, the crane can actually sort of tweak it, but it's, it's pretty amazing. The building, the building is really kind of a, a marvel. And the last thing we'll do is, um, last project I'll show you is uh, Fulbright University, which is the Fulbright Institute had a competition. Um, basically, the head of the Fulbright, a guy named Tom Vallali, was a Vietnam vet and a Fulbright scholar. Um, and so was um, uh, John Kerry and John McCain. And so uh, during the last administration, they got together and they thought that what they wanted to do for Vietnam is open the first liberal arts university in the country. And they worked out a deal uh, working with the Obama administration and the Vietnamese government said that they would have no oversight over the pedagogy of the school or the academic programs. And that was part of the deal. Vietnam gave them 60 acres and uh, um, the Obama administration gave them funding to start the whole project and they're fundraising right now. And they had a competition to design the whole campus, which we were lucky enough to win. Um, it's super very early and I don't have a lot of stuff, but I'll just show a couple things. We studied uh, 200 university plan campuses around, the, around the, the country and the world. Sort of came with this central lawn, but like infilled with the sort of Ho Chi Minh city blocks. It was this no notion of a, both a network and a central identity. And the idea was that the central identity could be built in the first phase so that the students didn't feel like they were living in a construction zone for the 20 years that it's going to be built. So the first phase gives them a place that feels like a school, and then everything can happen on the outside over the, over the coming years. Um, this was our site, so yeah, a lot to draw from uh, on a flat piece of dirt with some weeds on it, 60 acres. There was like nothing to, to come up with. Um, but one of the issues, for those of you who've been to Vietnam, um, there are scooters everywhere. It's just like, it's like insane. And um, we went to visit all the universities in Vietnam and spent a lot of time there. And one of the things that really kind of kills it is that the scooters are parked like every, everywhere. You can't even walk anywhere. So we wanted to figure out how to make a scooter-free campus. And the idea was to just have two places to enter and similarly to Botswana, put all the parking on the ground and then berm the whole university up and make it so that there were like a variation between ha-has and walls and other things you could never drive onto the campus. So there were entries, the central lawn, the parking system that feeds into the three phases, it starts with a kind of library, and then they wanted a sort of maker and arts building. So the library is at the front and the, the maker and arts building is at the back, connected by two academic bars. And then this is the landscape buffer and we had to do our own uh, stormwater retention on the site and the buffer acts as this uh, thing to keep the scooters from coming on and also to kind of give it this campus. And then the idea is in the future that there would be sort of four what we're calling icon buildings for the sort of you know, athletics or performing arts or other kinds of things and that they would sit at the end of a series of alleys. And these are not the shapes of the buildings, this is just a master plan and that we could build the alley, so the, the, the middle would get built first, you could plant the alleys so that you would have the trees and you would almost sort of see from the center of campus where it's going, and then as each donor contributed to each um, of the ICOM buildings, you would build them and then you would fill it in with academic infill and then with the dorms uh, sort of in the middle making these smaller quads and these laneways and the proportions and everything were taken from traditional Vietnamese architecture, and then that's the entire campus. So we're working on the first phase, the, that whole first ring, which is eight buildings. And here you can see the sort of section, how it berms up and how the loading docks are underneath this kind of amphitheater that looks back on the lawn. And then the library really isn't about books, but it's really a, an idea about um, sort of teaching what a liberal arts education means and what free speech means, and it's really kind of a forum. The building is really driving, is driven around 
this idea that anyone can have a voice and that you have your own agency and it's a place to gather. And it really acts as a kind of lantern at the front of the university. You know, it's not, it's not a church, it's not a library, it's not, a, it's not an administrative building, it's a building for the students first and foremost. And that would be on 24 hours a day. And so it's really this kind of large forum with gallery and some admin and media and everything going around it and a kind of view of what, what uh, it'll look like on the inside, looking at it from the front on the entry. And then this will be the quad with the, with the buildings, the academic bars, and then at the end of the quad will be the arts and maker building. Um, and this is a very special tree that means something in, in Vietnam, and so we're transplanting it from the original campus and bringing it there and giving it its location, and then that's where sort of graduation takes place. Um, it also rains a tremendous amount in, um, in Vietnam, really heavy for hard times and then it's, for long times, and then it just sort of becomes sunny. And so all the water is held on the roofs, but then is let out very slowly from the roof so that there'll almost always be these kind of two waterfalls uh, going that'll sort of create the sound in that, in that area and be the thing that, when, that's sort of the back of the forum so that when you come up, it'll be about the students, it'll be lit, the water will be coming down and you can move right through and into the building and into the quad itself. So again, we're now meeting with, we're fundraising, we're meeting with all the fabricators, we're figuring, we're teaching them how to make all the stuff there uh, and it's well underway and it's been, a, it's been a fantastic experience. So in summary, I just want to say that, um, you know, we, we started just five of us, we just battled our way through a lot of stuff. We, we, took a lot of risks that they tell you not to take. We just tried to make stuff ourselves. We tried to just figure it out. Um, we took, we had lots of errors and picked bad clients and messed things up and got dirty and lost money and made money and it didn't matter. It was just really about taking risk. You know, I believe that architecture is the last great generalist profession. What we're good at is that we're good at so many dif different things and we are probably one of the great synthesizers out there. There are so many incredibly complex problems that we're dealing with and yet somehow the AIA try to make us specialists, try to make us just about the image of a building or the wrapper of the building or, or, or something like that. That's not what, that, we don't believe that's the way that the profession should go and if it wants to be relevant and it wants to have a seat at the table, it's got to speak all these other languages, not just architecture. It's got to be able to talk to everyone else and it's about making, obviously like sustainability and environmental issues are incredibly important to us, but it's not about like throwing sustainable bling on a building by filling it with photovoltaics. It's about making really smart public spaces, great buildings. The most sustainable thing you can do is build a building that people love and take care of forever and ever so it doesn't get renovated every 20 years. And out of high quality materials that age and patina gracefully in great public space with fantastic density that's connected to mass transit. That's the most sustainable thing we can do. If we want to make super dense cities and connect them with cars and not have mass transit and not invest in public space, it's going to be a terrible future. But there's one group out there that can fix that, and we're all sitting here right now. And so unless we're able to speak all those languages and get involved and be committed to it, we're going to get pushed to the side, and we don't believe that that's what's good for us, and I don't believe that this generation is going to do that either. So what I'd say is get dirty, try stuff, take risks mess up and hopefully every once in a while you get a pretty good building and people are really happy with what you do. And the, my favorite thing about being an architect is when the building is done and I turn my back to it and I watch people come to it for the first time and when they smile and they put their family or their friends together and they take a picture, you know you've done something right. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to take a few questions. I know you're all in studio and everything. I won't be offended if you have to go back. Sure. Uh, all of the above. 
but most of it is really, it, I mean, we have strategic relationships with many software and technology companies. They, they've seen, we've, we've developed a lot of it in-house by ourselves, and then we have a whole group that really works on nothing but R&D. But then, because they've seen some of the things that we've done, a lot of the companies will come to us and we'll be a beta tester, or they'll try things out with us and we'll tell them what it needs to do or not do. And, um, but then we've also been a kind of incubator as well. So we've spun four technology companies out of shop. Um, two failed, that's okay, because we tried, and two are doing pretty well. Um, and so, um, you know, it's like, and a lot of the ideas come from staff. It doesn't come from the shoppers. And like, it's whatever, like anyone at, anyone at shop can come to, the, to the, uh, the, the partners and sort of pitch an idea to do an R&D project and sort of say like, hey, I think this is something that we deal with all the time that there's no good solution for and I need three months to research it and can you fund it for this and blah, blah, blah. And like, we'll, we'll support a lot of it, but they've got to, you know, we'll grill them. It's, what's that show, Shark Tank? It's a little bit like Shark Tank. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but that's where a lot of things co have come from in the office. So it's, <clears throat> it's, it's not terribly official. It's a little grassroots. We definitely have some strategic outside partnerships, but really most of it comes from within. Sure. That's a really good question. Um, I think, I, don't, I hate to be so non-committal because it's not really who I am, but like I think a little bit of both. Like sometimes we, sometimes there's a design idea and we just don't know how to do it and we have to, and no one else does, so we have to just come up with a solution to patch it. I think other ideas have been good but failed or some were not as good ideas as we thought and we've had to close them down. And sometimes, sometimes they've, Sometimes things didn't work because of the timing, like we were too early on a bunch of stuff, and then like five years later, we'll hear someone like at a tech conference say like, well, what we need in real estate tech is something like this, and like, didn't we do that five years ago, and it was a failure, and we'll dig it back up and kind of reposition it. So, you know, it's like, um, you know, th there are lots of things you do in a design studio that never see the light of day, but that doesn't like that never get built or or get value engineered or whatever. Like, but that doesn't mean they weren't incredibly valuable because they totally help you learn for the next things that you're going to do. And I think it's the same way with all of these endeavors that we try to take on. In the back. Well, first of all, thank you for such an inspiring presentation. Thank you. And then I have a one question. Um, Probably a lot of us know there is another project in Philadelphia next to 30 Street Station. There's, I'm sorry, what? I couldn't hear uh, you. There is another project in Philadelphia next to the 30 Street Station, yes. the Drexel University one. So I'm wondering, can you share some stories about the design for that project? Yeah, sure. Are you, uh, Thank you. School yards. So that was a master planning project that we did. And, um, uh, and then, so we helped with the master plan. I think we did some of the public space with West Aid. It was not my project in the office. It was one of my partners. Um, but uh, we had a partner that decided to leave, which was great. And we told them that they could take that project. So we're actually not working on it anymore. So I can, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> the project I really wanted was the rebuild of the Villanova basketball stadium, but I, and I should have had it, but Jay Wright wanted me to do it, but I didn't get it, so. Hey, thank you for a great lecture. Um, so as a student, my biggest fear when I'm gonna go to the real world is bureaucracy, for many reasons I think, like, I think it's very easy to be cynical as a young architect about bureaucracy, dealing with all these fluxes. And I really appreciate the way you kind of embrace bureaucracy by kind of monopolizing the whole building process to a certain extent. You're the designer and the contractor, et cetera. So I'm curious as to kind of um, that relationship you have with bureaucracy and mm -hmm. also if you have any kind of future plans as to how you want to deal with bureaucracy. Like if maybe if you have enough money, you want to be also your own client, et cetera. So just curious about that. So. Um, great question. So um, someone the other day was saying like, uh, a bureaucrat was never fired for saying no. So that's why they say no all the time. 
So um, it's, always a battle, it's always a battle with people who don't understand it. So I think really what it comes down to to successfully navigate those situations is communication. And, and that's what we do as architects, right? We, we don't build buildings. We make instruction sets to communicate to somebody else how to build the building. So we should be great communicators, right? But sometimes we make it so opaque and complicated that no one really knows what you're talking about. So our greatest success with, with dealing with difficult situations, whether it's bureaucracy or an established hierarchy of, of power or construction techniques or, or, or uh, underwriting uh, uh, systems for how banks will financing, which is actually where most of the problem is, by the way. Most of the problem is the way, the way things get financed. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, like, and we could talk about this for, well, I won't talk about it for hours, but I can. But it's a, it's a, it's really actually, that's the hardest part. Um, and we can, you know, we'll talk about it later. So the, um, uh, the, the, the issue is the better that you can communicate and the more clearly you can get your ideas across and get them to ask the right questions back so that it creates a dialogue, that's when you get, that's when we have found you get things through and approved. So that's, that's really the, that's really the, the, the key thing. Um, we do sometimes take equity positions in some of our projects. Um, we've done very well on some of them and that's helped fund shop. We've also gotten killed on other ones, um, and that's okay. And probably at the end of the day, we broke even, but a lot of those projects would have never happened unless we had what they say, skin in the game with those guys who let us take risks that they normally wouldn't let you take risks for. And so at the end of the day, even if you broke e even, we see it as like it expanded, it expanded the territories within which that we could operate and the opportunities that we had in front of us to try and push, push the ideas forward. So like, don't worry about the money, worry about the ideas. Sure. How do you feel about the way the appearance and the skyline of New York has changed. I have always liked skyscrapers, and I don't dislike your building, but to me, it's just too much. It's destroying what the character was, and therefore, I just was curious, do you feel that way? Because it just, it just seems above and beyond. It's too much. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. So look, there, there are the super talls were going to get built. I wanted to do one, <laughs> being honest, right? Like, and I wanted, to do, I wanted to take the challenge on to do the best one. Time will tell if it's the best one or not the best one. That's not for me to decide. Um, there are a couple that I can honestly say I don't love. I kind of like them more now because I'll be next to them for the next 100 or 200 years and will always look a little bit better than those, so that's okay for us. Um, as far as the changing skyline, um, you know, I read a lot of prima, I'm a New York nut, I grew up there and I love this stuff, and I read a lot of the prima facie sort of like articles and things that were said and debates from the 19th century, from the early 20th century. And the one thing I always noticed is, it's the same argument for hundreds of years. There were huge outcries when all the single family residents on Fifth Avenue were being knocked down to put up those monstrous, disgusting, gaudy, new money, 18 story buildings. It's the same thing, who are these people? They're not from New York, they're foreigners that came here and made money and they're parking their money in these mansions in the sky. It's the same argument in the 1880s, in the 1920s, in the 1960s, and today. And so I think the great thing about New York's, do, like I said, do I love every single one? Do I think some of them are, uh, yes, no, I, that's not it. But I think the thing that keeps New York vibrant is the fact that it can change and it can absorb change. 
And the second you lock a city down into being what it is, the city's dead. That's the end of creativity, that's the end of culture, it becomes entombed, and I think that New York, the idea of the grid and the idea of this island and this idea of a trading port and the idea of a city that was not founded on religious fervor, it was founded on, thank the Dutch, it was founded on trade and inclusion and it was, it was always about, you know, there were 60 languages spoken in New York 20 years after it was founded and it was always a city that was open like that and I think you know, it's Great Harbor and a lot of other reasons helped it, but I think that, that the city is strong enough to, to absorb these new waves of things. And I am sure that your grandchildren will complain about the 200 foot, the 200 story buildings that go in, or the buildings that float above Central Park, or when we fill in, when there's no more, uh, when, the, when the Hudson River is all the way in. It's gonna change, and our, I think the city can take it. It's really my opinion. I think everything you say is true, but when you think of what sustainability really means, to my mind, for human beings, given the conditions prevailing, to even imagine that they could feel comfortable 95 stories up is arrogant and, and just unwise. And so I think there's a difference. The changes that came before resulted and still there being an agreeable human scale. I mean, we, and let, well, maybe we'll change and we'll be that maybe tall. We'll. <laughs> Is that, oh, oh, there's one over here, sorry. Hi, um, thank you again for this awesome lecture. Um, in your first slide, when all of the questions were popping up, I noticed one of the questions was, um, something about the design software being more of a design, well, could it be more of a design challenge, something that you can use in design rather than just being a design tool? And you seem to embrace a lot of um, digital fabrication and all these um, you know, different technological innovations in your building. So I was just wondering what your take on computer-aided design is and how do you maintain that balance of still maintaining your touch because that's really a prevalent question here. And mm -hmm. just a follow-up question is, how do you see the future of um, digital fabrication right now in construction methods and in the future of architecture? Uh, we're about to, I think, I mean, McKinsey just came out with a report last year that looked at every industry, every global industry since World War II, and the industry, innovation in every single industry since World War II. And the industry that came in last is construction, behind farming. Think about that. And so I think that we are about to see a, disrupt, a major disruption in the entire industry. It's, it's going to happen. And there are, we've started another company that's about a new kind of construction technique. We're out in the valley, we're on our second fundraising round and whether we do it or other people do it or 100 people do it, I don't even know, but it's just we felt like it, it, it's going to happen, so we may as well try and see what we learn from it. But I think you're gonna see a disruption in our, in construction, which will then affect architecture and the profession more profoundly than anything that's happened in the, in the past 200 years. It's coming, so we better be prepared. I didn't mean to be such a downer. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually excited by it. I, yeah, it came off really depressing. I didn't mean that at all. I'm like super psyched about it. Like it's going to be cool. Like actually, and if we're smart and ask the questions, sorry, this is really what I wanted to say. If we're smart and ask the questions that we're talking about it. We could help and be in control and actually have more agency through the whole thing. Like that's it. But it's coming. Like don't fool yourself. And there are billions pouring in from, from Silicon Valley because they know that it has to happen. Okay. Why don't we, why don't we end, we'll end on that one. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>